Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. Great. Seems like we have 22 people and, um, and growing. So thanks for joining us so much. Um, my name is Aphrodite. Uh, I work on the government relations team at Lighthouse Labs. Uh, previously did community management. And before that, I was an intern and I worked with Char, um, which was so awesome. So um, really happy to uh, have this conversation today. Um, if you don't know what Lighthouse Labs is, we're a digital skills training institution focused on web development, data analytics, and data science. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about upskilling today. Um, but before we do that, uh, I'd love to invite my two awesome chat buddies. I don't even want to say panelists, just chat buddies uh, today uh, to introduce themselves. So we have uh, Shar and Lloyd. So Shar, do you want to go ahead? Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Charlene Fothergill. Uh, so yeah, a little about me. I'm uh, HR is kind of my core career background. Um, and then, um, but I've been in the Vancouver startup scene for probably the last 12 years. Um, I moved from HR in a tech company to running the Grow Lab accelerator program that merged to become Highline and went from there to spend five years at Lighthouse Labs setting up their career services department, where Afro was an intern at one point for us, um, and really work to kind of set up the processes, the people, and the programming that helps all the Lighthouse Labs students get jobs upon graduation and was a big part of that uh, strategy team and kind of helping Lighthouse Labs um, become where it is today, if I do say so myself. Um, I wrapped up my time with Lighthouse Labs back in February, so not too long ago. Um, and joined CTO.ai, which is a product-based um, VC-backed um, company here in Vancouver. And what we do is we are helping make DevOps more accessible to developers. So we believe DevOps is super complicated for developers. The average dev just can't access it. It's also super um, not being leveraged by businesses on a metric side. So our product is really designed to make DevOps more accessible and enjoyable for the next 40 million devs. And I'm the senior <laughs> HR business partner there. So that's what I'm doing now. Thanks so much, Char. And Lloyd. Hey, hey everyone. My name's Lloyd. Uh, I'm an engineer actually at ABooks, which is an Amazon subsidiary. So I've been here for almost six years, actually. So I worked through the business teams, um, actually took a leave of absence to do uh, Lighthouse Labs, um, graduated in December and came back to work here, actually, um, at ABooks. So I've been here for and doing the intern job, actually, since about March. So now I'm working through that uh, and transition through there. Took a long route to get to a developer, though. So I actually started probably HTML programming when I was like eight, like working on Color Max, like back when you actually had Black and White Max and Color Macintosh. So I might be dating myself by actually saying that. But uh, it kind of took a long route. It went through like a tugboat captain, did some forestry logging, uh, went to business school, photography school, um, and then uh, through Lighthouse Labs to bring me into where I am as a developer. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Thanks so much. Um, and what? yeah, so exciting. Um, obviously, like we are going to talk about kind of that experience you went to, uh, you know, be working at a company for a long period of time and and taking, uh, you know, getting support to kind of take that absence and, and upskill up and come back. So um, yeah, today uh, we're gonna talk about upskilling. So if, if you were to Google upskilling and the effects of it, you know, uh, you would find that there's been an increasingly large amount of articles that have happened since March. And of course, March was the beginning of the uh, coronavirus pandemic Canadian shutdown. Um, and so, it's a hot topic right now, and, and we kind of want to dive in why it's important and, and why it's relevant now more than ever. Um, basically, I've been doing a lot of research myself. Um, we're looking at the way education has changed and the way that employees can invest in their, in their employ the employers can invest in the employees, there we go. Um, so just to, I was doing some reading and uh, Deloitte Canada actually released a report on, uh, they call it the upskilling imperative. So they're talking about uh, the importance of deliberate investment into talent and to help kind of shorten that skill gap in your employees and make Canada future ready. Uh, that is kind of a, a glossy term, what does future ready mean? Basically the idea was um, the future of work is not, it's a lot, uh, it came a lot quicker than we thought because of what happened in March. Uh, the idea of working remotely, uh, turning to digital skills, uh, automation, stuff like that, it, it's here and it kind of just, I don't want to say slapped us in the face, but it happened in a very quick amount of time. And, um, 
it's time for us to talk about how do we uh, adapt uh, our businesses and also adapt our employees to keep up with it in a way that makes sense. Um, so we're going to talk about two angles, really, um, the idea of upskilling and the importance of that within your company for making it future ready, but then also from the employee side. And that's kind of why I love having Char here, you know, HR veteran, and then also Lloyd to talk about as an employee, kind of what upskilling means to you and uh, the effect that it can have on you um, and, and why it's an, it's an important thing. Um, because I think we do talk a lot about getting businesses like future ready, like do this training program, you'll be good to go, you're good to go. But from the employee side of things, it's also a completely different uh, meaning. So uh, we're going to do that. So I'd love to start off by just uh, talking about uh, why do you think upskilling is very important, especially now within companies and, and what effect do you think it's going to have on, on rebuilding Canada? Yeah, I mean, I, I can start. So yeah, I, I mean, I think upskilling was important before. I think it's just being talked about now more. And I think that's kind of for two reasons. So one of the reasons I think it's being talked about more is simply that people have lost jobs and then all of a sudden they need new jobs. And that's where I think industry who wasn't really listening when this was all being talked about before has gone, oh crap, like the people we need or you know the government's gone we need to get these people new jobs that's they're part of their responsibility in like economic uh, growth and development of countries and they're they're really having to deal with it like it or not now um and things are just changing so quickly the jobs that were around five ten years ago and i used to recruit for devs five ten years ago it's a different skill set than what i'm recruiting for now when i'm recruiting for devs it's just things come in like even look at social media it's probably the easiest one for most people to wrap their heads around if we think you know 20 years ago 15 years ago which isn't that long ago when you think in terms of your career, um, it, it, those jobs didn't exist. There was no person managing your Twitter account. And then there was a person managing the Twitter account. And now that person not only needs to just kind of manage it, there's like these tools they have to use and their strategy pieces and that skill set and that job descriptions that did, just didn't even exist keeps growing. And that's just one example. So I think, you know, with people losing their jobs, with businesses needing to shift and being forced to pivot and really think about survival in some cases, and then also optimization, lots of businesses have been able to take this opportunity and actually come out better. And we're, we're actually one of them where we think that at the end of this, this is going to be a blessing in disguise. Um, it's really just thrown a lot of questions and, uh, you know, the corners they've had to look around that they weren't really paying attention to because we didn't have to, we could have our heads in the sand a little bit. So it's, it's, I think your term of slapping people in the face is really relevant to this because this isn't new. The, I mean, I mean, maybe I'm biased. I worked at Lighthouse Labs for five years, but there's a whole business based on it. Um, and it's, it's certainly not the only um, people thinking about this. And, and yeah, I totally agree. We definitely, because we've worked in that field of of upskilling and reskilling and workforce development. It's kind of something that we've been waiting for and it's happening really quickly. So it's it's exciting uh, to kind of be able to, you know, ha read a lot of thought leadership articles by people who I never would have thought 10 years ago would be even talking about it. So um, yeah, definitely, definitely agree. How about yourself, Lloyd? Yeah, I mean, it's perfect for Lighthouse Labs because you guys were perfectly positioned to actually take advantage of the people wanting to upskill and having maybe a little more available time to do so. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like embedding education and learning in an organization is actually really important. And the companies that were already doing it, I think that are the companies that you actually see grew and were perhaps really strong in the last while. And for like me as an employee, I think it's really important to, to, to have that opportunity to be able to upskill within the organization without necessarily jumping jobs to be able to take advantage of those things or take some time off but I think that um, those companies that did take advantage of that are perhaps are doing really well right now, like Lighthouse Labs. Yeah, I also think that like one of the things is other industries are getting shifted into what tech is always known. I feel like working in tech, the expectation both from the employee and the employer has been about continuous learning. And that looks like different things, uh, like the tactics can look very different for different companies. But that expectation that, the you know, you come in day one and you just stop learning, you're some kind of expert and you never have to evolve, adapt or pick up new skills, thoughts or knowledge just isn't something we've ever thought in tech. It's just not the way it is, but other industries now are being forced to kind of realize that. So I think that's a big shift um, in, in kind of mindset and what's going on uh, due to COVID. Totally, totally, 100% agree. And, and 
I hope that with that shift, it becomes easier for employees to have that conversation with their employers. I think um, maybe another shift, and I don't know if you'll agree, Shar, you probably will, but <laughs> when it comes to HR, is it, it used to be maybe about 10 years ago, the attractive part of a company, kind of what you're saying, like, you know, is um, the open workspace and a bit of a flexibility and, and mm -hmm. stuff like that and, and the food. And, and now the shift is like, how is, how is this company going to help me adapt and, and maybe invest in my, in my learning? We're looking for rapid uh, training. Um, there's some like really, really interesting programs that are out there right now. Like uh, a lot of companies, we're seeing it happen with Microsoft and Google, but even Shopify itself here, come take our specific program and then you will work for us in the retraining, you know? So um, I think there's now that shift. People are looking more for uh, how can I embed my lifelong learning into my company uh, versus just get a job. Um, and the concept of lifelong learning is, is so different now. Um, I, I would have thought maybe, you know, around when, maybe when my parents would suffer going, it'd be about continuing education, schools, you know, you take a night class or something like that. Now it's, it's quite different. And, and now you can have those conversations with your, with your employer. Um, Lloyd, I'm curious, do you remember that process when you kind of decided, I don't want to leave this company, but I, I want to see if they're going to you know, work with me to, to come back. And, and when you did it, you know, was it something that you were confident it was going to go well? Were you kind of trying to figure it out? What was that process like? It's a good question. Um, so I do distinctly remember that process because it's a big part of like why I'm actually still here at A-Books. Um, it's, they've always it kind of embedded education like throughout it. So it, they actually are a dedicated time to be able to take time off. And that's one thing that I was always passionate about before it had been interesting things. Like I actually did took more time off to do like first aid courses before I was more interested in doing like developer time, but upskilling things that were maybe valuable for both like myself as well as the company. Um, being able to take advantage of that and have a, actually having like a clear defined set process before the stuff came up was, it was easy for me to take advantage. But it actually had some defined roles, like the boot camp itself wasn't actually included. So I had to have some conversations with our leadership to, to maybe challenge some of the things that we have. But with the support of the managers here and being able to talk through that, I was able to actually allow them to, to give me a little bit of the tuition reimbursement for that, an already established process, but trying to do something a little bit new and take advantage of you know maybe new things that are coming along. Um, but I was a little unsure like what exactly that might look like coming back because there I haven't there's no one really in our organization that's taken the path that I've had where I've taken specifically time off to do like a long term boot camp. It wasn't like a two week course that I took some time off. It was off for three months to be able to do that. Um, and so there was actually a lot of conversations that I think happened like internally here. Um, but having that support of the managers and like uh, them knowing that education and learning and skill development is really important to their employees was the part that made me have confidence. So it did take a little while, like after I came back for me to transition into something that I was looking for, but it made me value both the managers and the company itself by having that opportunity. So um, I guess fortitude was really, all it really took is just having those conversations, being open about it, being open to what I want and being having the support of the managers that were around me. Yeah. And I mean, I think Lloyd's situation is like the dream situation. Like I'm mindful that probably a lot of people here are startups and like, how do you do that? So kind of just to talk about like the business case of like why you would support someone. And I get that it looks different for every company. Like I don't necessarily have someone at our company right now that that would work to do that. But institutional knowledge is a huge thing. So any company that's dealt with turnover and, and, you know, we all deal with it now, just given either our companies change and therefore it's, it's the right path for people to move on to new things or just given the fact that, you know, whatever, we're supposed to have seven to 10 jobs or careers in our lifetime sort of thing. Um, you know, Lloyd having that institutional knowledge and then coming back, yes, he's coming back to the junior dev and there's gonna be like a ramp up period and a training period. And you obviously need to make sure that you can support someone, but he's coming back knowing how your product works. He's coming back already being a cultural fit. Like all those unknowns that go into hiring, 
Lloyd's Lloyd has them in spades already. So it's a really, you know, dream scenario if a company can also support that 12 weeks off, which is it again, not always, but just to kind of build the case and bring it back to why as a company should you think about supporting your staff? And obviously, you know, that's one extreme on the end, but even just supporting staff with like micro learning or looking at things like LinkedIn learning. Uh, there's lots of platforms out there now. I've been really exposed to them a lot in our company. There's a really cool one. I'm going to give them a plug. I love what they're doing. They're called Verb. Um, and they're actually really focusing on like soft skills. So helping people learn about emotional intelligence and they're leaning into diversity and inclusion right now and some management courses. So there's just all these ways to do learning. It, you know, it doesn't have to be this big formal thing. And obviously developing those policies makes it easier for employees like Lloyd to ask, but just making it okay for people to ask to go to a conference or to take a course and then, you know, making sure they're held accountable for doing so and that you have your outcomes and all those kind of business cases that make it worth the budget. Cause one thing COVID has left a lot of people with really tight budgets. Um, but there's also a lot of free content online. You can do book clubs. Like I I've, I've never read more in my life. Like, and it's kind of trendy and cool. Like if, in my, in HR, if you haven't read like, you know, a certain list of books or aren't reading a certain <laughs> list of books, like you're, you're not in the cool kids group. Um, and you can do those things. And those are all, those all count as learning as well. Different ways of thinking, different mind shifts and applying those learnings into your, into your practices with work and stuff like that. My path was definitely a little more extreme and you're right. It's totally like a dream. I don't know if there's a lot of organizations that would both be able to financially support me yeah. mm -hmm. as well as um, like allow me to take the time off. So I'm definitely on the, the like extreme side of that, mm -hmm. but there's smaller opportunities. I know a lot of the like other people here that do take like shorter amounts of time off, whether that's a week or two to maybe do like DevOps training or something like that. But they actually come back and share that knowledge within the organization as well. It's like they do a little presentation and then we do a knowledge share and distill the really important parts of what they learn and pass that within the organization, both perhaps within like a little meeting and then documentation. So things that are actually really important and can be passed in through the organization as well. I'm yeah, and I actually, I'm just reminded a lot of uh, conversations I used to have with employers at Lighthouse Labs when I was uh, doing business development for career services is, you know, they would say, I can't find that DevOps person or I can't find that iOS developer. And, you know, they're like, we need an intermediate, we need an intermediate. And it is kind of challenging that timeline of like, there is a market gap for certain positions. Like I said, the positions that existed 10 years ago aren't the positions that exist today. So there's gonna be talent gaps and we're gonna to continue to see those like gaps and, and places like Lighthouse Labs that condense learning and make kind of micro learning happen are gonna be key to, to us sustaining that as an, an economy and, and workforce. But you know, you gotta look and you can be like, okay, you could have an open requisition for an intermediate level iOS person for six months. But what if you sent one of your, your regular devs or one of your junior iOS people to, to upskill for a certain amount of time and then you get them to come back, you still have to ramp them up, but it's like, how much quicker will they ramp up knowing your product? Again, all those like intangibles of your, your culture, your workflow, like their ramp up time is condensed. So it, it sometimes just becomes challenging our way of thinking, which I love that COVID has done that. I'm someone that always is like a crazy ideas person and like, why do we do this? Why do we have to do it this way? I hate being like told what to do just because. So I think it's, 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 you know, the founders and the people listening, it's, it's kind of thinking we all went, work from home. We can't do that. That's too complicated. I, I can't trust my employees. And then we were forced to do it and we figured it out. And most of us are going, wow, that's really awesome. So when you're thinking of your learning and kind of these extreme cases, maybe you challenge yourself to think of that extreme case of like, huh, what would happen? And what are the alternatives if I don't do that? Because I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what Lloyd's, you know, feelings were, but you know, if I feel really stuck in my job or, you know, employees leave, they cite things like that on the exit interviews all the time as they just felt that they couldn't grow and they couldn't learn anymore. So now you're dealing with losing someone, losing that institutional knowledge, that open requisition, hiring is still hard, despite that there's some good people out there who need jobs. And, you know, all of that, three months at bootcamp, right? So it, it's just, sometimes it's just challenging our way of thinking and, and thinking things are possible that we thought were impossible and lean into that, what COVID's really taught us to, to kind of be more open to some of those like crazy ideas that maybe aren't so crazy anymore. Yeah. Totally, totally agree with you, um, Shar. And yeah, just, just kind of coming back to that point on uh, employees feeling a little bit stuck. I, you know, two, I don't know if I mentioned this already, but uh, a week ago, LinkedIn was, you know how they have the news on the sidebar and they have trending articles. There was, uh, I think there was like 1500 people were talking about uh, what do you do when you feel like you're lucky to have a job because it's a pandemic, but you're not fulfilled and you're not motivated 
and there's no end in sight, per se, and you're at home, so we layer on the pandemic, and uh, the idea that that motivation just kills, and if you embedded just a little bit of micro-learning um, into it, it could really, really, you know, help the employees feel like they are actually moving forward. And I mean, a great example, uh, sometimes I like to use this myself. Um, I just recently started on the government relations team and I, you know, got to talk with my managers and, and we talked about how for me, I need a good hour in the morning, every morning to read the news because I need to be able to respond and well, not respond. I mean, my job's not that fancy, but be able to, uh, wrap my head around what's going on in the world. And even though it's not a direct output of a wor of work, it's something that's helping me learn. And that even in a sense to me is like a micro learning, like being able to uh, read reports about what's going on and kind of get a different sense. Um, and it's kind of forcing me to learn and lean into this role. Um, and uh, I, I absolutely love that. And, and we also talked about, um, Shari, you were saying, and, and Lloyd, and I completely agree, Acknowledging that this is a financially very, very diff difficult year, you know, we're, we're pending a recession, potentially, you know, we, the businesses got hit, startups got hit, my heart, you know, it's just like, no, you know, that so many, so much hard work going into startups and, and seeing some great startups born out of it, seeing some great Vancouver companies really grow have, has been amazing. Um, you know, think if it's a great example, great to hear their news yesterday about yeah. their uh, funding and um, and stuff like that. So, uh, but acknowledging that you you can't just pay for a boot camp or expect someone to say, "Hey, I'm going to give you two thousand dollars." Even that, right? So, uh, I'd love. I, I don't know. We have about five people here. You can interact with the chat if you want, but maybe um, and and we'll keep riffing on this. But if people want to post kind of some different ways that they would like to learn in their company that maybe is low cost or cost free that they'd like to have a conversation with their employer. Um, so we talked about micro learning. Um, and I think that is a very kind of a uh, glossy, sexy word, you know, people are really into the micro learning. Um, but uh, yeah, what are some good examples of, of micro learning that uh, maybe people could uh, take advantage of? I mean, I actually, like, personally, like I come in and like check all my tickets and take a look at what I should be looking for the day. And I actually, very similar to what Afro does, is I probably spend my first hour like spending a little time learning because that actually helps engage my brain for a little bit later. And I have lots of things bookmarked, but even just like little things, there's there's tons of actually lots of great courses. For me, since I'm working on primarily like AWS services, I have a lot to learn in those areas. So I come in and actually read some of the, the videos or documentation that they've actually got there. And when I say documentation, more like blog posts, because those are a lot more interesting than read than developer documentation. Um, but that actually like gets me a little bit inspired. And I've never really thought of it as micro learning before, nor have I uh, used that term, but it's actually really cool. And I think that that's a really good way to look at it. It's like micro learning is extremely important. I think for me personally, because if I don't continue learning, then I get a little bit bored. And I don't want to become complacent. Like I just want to continue learning and grow. That's that's I, that's one of the reasons why I've been able to to keep working here. And I think that's one of the topics of conversation that maybe for today is that growing for me as an employee is really important. And having that opportunity, even if it's micro learning or if it's like spending a couple hours in something that I feel passionate about, that either is good for me or can help the company as well. I think that's really important. So I think maybe distilling it down to micro learning and giving yourself. 10 minutes or 20 minutes just to be able to get a, a little bit more information in your brain, I think would be really important. Yeah. And I think um, it kind of loops back to, you know, like I said, at the top of there's, there's been an expectation in tech and now that's uh, bleeding out to other industries in regards to the expectation that both employers support ongoing learning, but also the expectation that employees come in with that mindset of lifelong learning. So I, I just love hearing both of you talk about how in your jobs, like Lloyd, yes, you got to go to boot camp, and that's obviously a very big thing, but you both just talked about that natural learning. And as an employer, that's what that's what I expect too. Um, you know, we we had LinkedIn learning um, before and and it was really great because it gave some of that micro learning to our devs. We have a really interesting tech stack, it's very dynamic. So it was like all of a sudden I was like, hey everyone, learn Rust. Um, and there was just some people that like took that on and it was it was exciting for them to do so. But we did have some people push back and be like, well, where's my time to do this? Like, and you know, we're not Google, unfortunately. We have small lean teams. We don't have the time to carve out 10% of the week or whatever. And it doesn't mean that if you if you want to kind of 
bring up a tutorial and you're learning throughout your day as you're doing, but that kind of dedicated time, your employer isn't always going to give it to you, especially in startups. Like if anyone here is going, Oh, I'm new to startups. Like it's lean, it's team. There's never enough time in the day and you know, the company needs to stay alive. So it, it, those big companies can give you that like carved off time. Like if you get a day to go to a conference and a startup, it's like, Woo, you got a whole day of doing another job than your actual job that's like, you know, pushing deadlines back. So I think that that's really on us as a generation and as job seekers to be continuous learning. And, you know, like you said, there, it's, there's so much free stuff out there right now. Like take advantage of it. I have leaned right in. Like, I feel like I've gotten a mini degree in diversity and inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion since the pandemic and, and then all the Black Lives Matter stuff, because there's just so much free content out there and it's quality stuff. And, you know, there's tons of like technical skills, digital skills. That's been a hot topic for, you know, probably a decade now. And there's so much free stuff. I mean, Lighthouse Labs put so much great free content to teach people to code and have coding literacy. So you don't need big budgets as a company to kind of encourage employees. And as individuals sitting at home, maybe feeling a bit stuck, you also don't need a lot of money to do it. Um, there's so much stuff out there for low cost. Coursera, like, dumps things on sale all the time, good or bad for the training providers. I know, think, I know, I know Thinkific, that's their whole thing is they, they, they don't do that kind of stuff, but um, yeah. you know, it, it, it's so out there. Thinkific is a great platform as well. There's so many people putting great content out and a lot of people are putting it out for free, free right now exactly. because, because they want to support people's continuous learning. So to be honest, like any job seekers out there as an employer, like that's a, question and and if you come to me and kind of expect me to spoon feed and hold your training and learning development plan on a silver platter like yeah. that's not really the reality for most startups and that's a very big company thing and even then like you still have to do it linkedin learning um we had a talk in our hr tech group about linkedin learning and, and similar platforms i'm not just plugging linkedin learning and people are saying well how do i implement it and as a company if there's any employers listening or hr folks listening you also can't necessarily do passive learning systems. They don't work for most people. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a combination of making sure if you are putting those learning development programs in place, you're spending the money, you're spending the time, make sure they're intentional and they're kind of integrated. Um, and, but it shouldn't be, you shouldn't need that to be a lifelong learner, continuous learner. Totally, totally. And, and, and going to that kind of idea of um, different, groups different age groups you know gen z's millennials baby boomers like everyone has their own way that they want to learn mm -hmm. and now there are so many many different uh platforms of course like generation z the reports come out gen z is like very digital nomad they prefer to learn online they don't see you know i don't know how they see about universities at, right now but like that's kind of their mode versus um maybe millennials are still kind of getting into that micro learning and then there's other generations where um it's a new world so um i i think having that option is is really great we actually have a question um and i'd love to see kind of what you guys think uh natay natay sorry if i say that wrong um so during this time what do you think is the most important thing to learn as an employee um there's so many things to learn. <laughs> I, I would say um, I'm going to hand it over to Lloyd first and then Char and then, then we'll see. Yeah. I actually saw that question and I've been thinking about that for a second because that's actually that's a really hard question, but important. And there's probably maybe two different ways you could approach that. And I think the first way would be like what my mom told me when I was little. It's like if you're passionate about something, you should like learn a little bit about it or like do something. So I think when you come across as passionate about something and at least for myself and like when i've had like employer interviews when you can see that passion and you're learning about that i think that's a really good skill to look into and it doesn't necessarily have to be a developer skill i, I am one but there's lots of other things for other people and if you're passionate about something as char was saying there's tons of free learning online and before i went to lighthouse that's actually what i was primarily doing even though i'm working it here at a large institutional organization i was doing free online learning actually through like mit and uh, harvard yeah. so they have a bunch of like free courses online just through edx and i was literally doing like first year harvard courses for free at my own leisure like i didn't have to do everything but i was learning a lot of like really important things that from really amazing instructors totally free um so there's lots of really good stuff um and I guess maybe the second way to approach this is like, what's the most important thing to learn is that look at the, the things that are in demand right now. Developers are in extreme high demand and I'm sure Afro and Char can, can attest to that as well. But there's lots of, and there's lots of different things in tech companies. It doesn't necessarily have to be developer roles 
product managers, um, support agency, even like technical support, I think are an extreme high demand for a lot of people. So you don't necessarily have to be a developer. There's lots of like tech-ish roles that both deal with support, but are on the technical side as well. And so I think there's lots of really important things you can learn there. Yeah, I think I think it comes down to like such a big question. What's the most important thing to learn? I think it comes down to what's the objective? Like, what do you want to get out of the time you're going to invest and potentially the money you're going to invest in learning? Is it to be a, a better dev? Then, OK, cool. Then maybe you need to like dive into like the skills that you don't have or, or dub, deep dive into a skill set that you're a little bit like lighter on sort of thing. You want to deep dive into JavaScript or Node or something because you want to be a better Node developer. If the outcome is that you want to just have uh, you know, more technical tool belt, cool, then maybe some digital, like just intro to code course and even understanding what the heck code is, which 100%, if you work in tech, I don't care if you're the receptionist, if you're the HR person, if you're the accountant, Afro's heard my rant before, you need to know what code is. It's just, it's just, you need to know what code is. If you work in tech, please take a free coding course. And, and I always say, listen, I hate code. I hate coding. Lighthouse Labs tried for five years to, to teach me to code. I, I don't enjoy it, but I know enough to know, to confidently say it's not for me. And that's okay because I know enough to know that it's not for me. So, um, you know, sorry, let's go back to kind of the, the question, my, my rant. Um, but, you know, I think it's just, it's what is that outcome? What are you working on? What skills do you feel like you're lacking? What, what do you want to learn or what do you feel like you need to learn to make either a career jump or career advancement and just kind of start there because you, you can learn anything. And then, you know, if, if it doesn't have to be about your career. Like I said, I'm super, I mean, DE&I is, is super important in my career, but like I'm taking the free U of A Indigenous Studies course right now, not directly related to my career, but I'm like, why would I not take that? It's free. That is a very good course. And as a Canadian citizen that probably needs to know more about my own country, I'm going to take advantage of that. And I feel like that's an important thing to be learning right now. So you can learn whatever. It's just figuring out why you're learning and what you want to get out of it. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there's so you could, yeah, you could learn for your own personal development, you can learn for your professional development. Um, and yeah, that the indigenous course, I, I saw it because uh, Daniel Lee yes. from Schitt's Creek, uh, which was a, a fantastic, I don't even think that was supposed to be influencer marketing, but it just goes to show like the power of, of one Canadian. But um, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's just so much more accessible. Um, and, and so micro learning is great. I, I do want to just kind of, uh, kind of coming towards the end of our chat today. I want to touch on one more topic that might not be seen as lifelong learning, but I think is actually very much uh, part of lifelong learning and that's, um, having mentorship within the mm -hmm. workplace. Um, I know personally, uh, at Lighthouse, I've gone through a couple different roles, um, which has been incredible opportunity to learn. And I've had different mentors from Shar to our CEO to our director of government relations. And kind of, I would say the most learning that I've done is just having that guidance and having that ability to to kind of bring ideas to someone and, and have them mentor you through it. Um, and it doesn't always, I, I think mentorship I don't always view it as a, like an education or, or learning sometimes, but it, it could be definitely another way for businesses to frame their version of life learning. Say, hey, um, you don't necessarily have to match up with a mentor, but maybe even having a once a week, 45 minute mentorship session with, with a senior person um, to share that knowledge. I guess that's what it's all about, lifelong learning, sharing knowledge. But I know for me personally, mentorship has been a hundred percent what keeps me going in a company. It's a hundred percent what I look for um, uh, because you not only get that real world experience from someone, but you, it's also someone that, that wants to help you grow. Mm -hmm. um, so what are your views on mentorship being another way that you can um, approach uh, lifelong learning and upskilling and uh, yeah, why is it important? Yeah, I mean, I think those things go hand in hand. And it is interesting, because you're right, we probably don't always think of that always. And from an organizational point of view, mentorship also 
sometimes just lives really organically. So I've never, I, I know Lighthouse Labs doesn't have a formal mentorship program in place, but yeah, that mentorship happens. Um, and I think, again, it's that expectation nowadays of both the employee and the employer. So from the employer side, they're, they're absolutely, it, or from the employee side, I'll start there, is there's absolutely an expectation of mentorship. And it's important because you're kind of left floundering um, and that can look different in different ways. So your company doesn't necessarily have, need to have a formal mentorship program in place. So those are very nice programs to have. They, they, they're hard. They're hard to put in place. They're hard to get off the ground. Um, but, you know, just investing in people and leaving lines of communication open and encouraging cross-functional discussion is, is something, too, we learn from just, like, talking to people who aren't in our day-to-day -day group. Um, and from the, you know, employee side, you know, there's that expectation that's what the company is going to give you. From the employer side, again, like, straight up just to toot Afro's horn a little bit because she totally deserves it. The reason why Afro's had so much success in mentorship and has had so many jobs at Lighthouse Labs and has moved along in that company is because she seeks it out. And I think that's, again, like that spoon fed. If you're just waiting for your employer to spoon feed you things, you need to go to a large company that like and maybe maybe they'll do that. It's really about having hustle taking your career into your own hands and asking. And, you know, I have definitely in my life had people kind of say, hey, Char, can I can I like pick your brain? And it, it can be simple as like I have people still reaching out to me. Some people that used to work at Lighthouse Labs will reach out to me and I'll I'll grab a coffee with them or just an ad hoc question. And they just know that they can reach out to me and we can have a discussion about it or I can help them out. So mentorship can look as e easy as that. Um, and then I think it's, yeah, it's, it's looking, making sure you're realizing the opportunities around you. We actually just hired a new VP of engineering at, at, at CTO today and he comes from TELUS. And um, so he used to be the chief architect there. And I'm like so excited to learn from him because I've never worked for a large company and he's sharing with me their practices of onboarding and hiring and, and org chart just discussion and I'm just like a little sponge and we've never talked about it I'm not like hey you're uh, you're my new mentor but I was like him joining the organization immediately I saw that opportunity to learn from him and I'm seeking that out I'm engaging in conversation and I'm engaging even at kind of a senior level there's still lots of room to learn and even just any time I get with my CEO like startups that's the best thing about a flat structure is you get time with really awesome senior people I treasure any time I get with my CEO is super busy. And if I can listen to him and ask questions and just, you know, ask about experiences, I learn so much too. So again, especially in the startup world, both if you're a founder and you're going, how do I give my employees all these programs? Or if you're an employee and going, I don't get any programs that work for a startup. It, it, it's, it's sometimes more organic than we think. And if we just, again, like expand the way we look at things and see things through a viewpoint, it's probably happening either happening a lot more than you think or really easy to happen without that like beautiful HR playbook, which listen, I would love to have that too of like, here's your mentorship path and program and like, here's your schedule. Like I, I haven't worked for a company that's given me that yet either. So you don't necessarily need that to 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 grow and, and continue to learn and, and the expectations on both ends. I really strongly believe in that. 100% and, and maybe Char, as these conversations are happening more and more, maybe in five years it will be, or five to 10 years, it will be a bit of a no brainer to be like, oh yeah, that's just a part of a process. You do a hundred percent. We do have those things in place, but it, it can definitely look uh, unique to, to everyone mentorship. I agree. I actually just thought about this platform. Um, it's a fantastic uh, founder. Her name is Maxine Cunningham and she founded a company called pick my brain yeah. and she's yeah, monetizing like the, the brain economy. Um, so you can pay money. She's trying to tell you like you are worth, you know, this much money for, for a 30 minute call or coffee and, and people are putting their expertise on there and you can pay to have a conversation with the leader. And I think the world is kind of moving towards that where it's like, that is just so important. And that's just an interesting revenue model in itself, right? But um, I, I absolutely think, love, love the opportunity to, to pick uh, the brain of, of any kind of upper level. And, and I, I sometimes get that reciprocated too, because like CEOs also want to know what's going on with their junior employee. Yeah. Of how what their generation's thinking versus other generations so it's it's really awesome um yeah and, and lloyd if you want to expand on anything there on mentorship 100 percent. yeah i mean I, i've actually been on both sides both as a, like as a coach and a mentee as well um on the coaching side that's like i can really see that like support helps a lot of people and like being a coach and like being able to like see the change and ask questions that maybe they weren't thinking of that just provides a different perspective 
So I, I didn't have a mentor when I first started here. And it, while it's a, like an established program, it's something that I actually had to seek out. I actually had to ask for a mentor and find a mentor and like do the, the legwork to actually get it. But what I actually got out of it was really important. And, and as I was saying, as a coach, it's like having those questions, like things that I hadn't even thought about that our seniors and our teams were able to provide information on. They weren't even on my team, they were on other teams yeah. within the org. So they're able to provide like uh, ask, answer questions for me and have like unbiased opinions that weren't directly on my team to, to be able to provide advice. Um, and I think that's extremely important. And if there's anyone out there that they like, need some help or has questions, feel free to reach out. Like I'm always happy to answer any questions okay. about development or if you have that stuff, uh, I'm happy to share everything that I've learned. And like within my org, um, because I'm kind of pioneered the way that I've taken, I've actually created a path for future people to do that and to be able to do the things that I did and have more of an established process and to be able to develop. Because um, our, our organization, at least in the States, does actually have a developer training program, but not in Canada. So I wasn't eligible for that. So I had to make my own path based upon what they were doing in the States. Um, and the mentors here, um, I have both one actually outside of work that was a former ABooks employees who has like a more broad perspective now working for different companies. And then a mentor um, within another team um, who is a senior developer. And that way I can ask them questions or if like, I feel like maybe I, shouldn't have been asking this in a team meeting like i felt the question was silly i would have asked my my mentor like hey can we sit down and do a 30 minute session on this or can you walk me through on this code review and it's something my mentor's happy to do because he's like providing the institutional knowledge and, and giving it to a different perspective so i'm i'm really happy that i have them and for anyone out there 100 percent get a mentor they're really important that's awesome yeah um it's 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 just great to hear that um there's just so many different routes now for for us to to upskill and and i'm curious you know if people maybe thought uh coming into this session where we're going to be talking about just like the importance of you know part-time web development data analytics courses and that's not really the case i mean of course those are options um when you want to get really technical but the idea that upskilling and when you read about it and when you're reading these thought leadership articles and maybe as a startup founder i think you know that's a lot of pressure to say how do i invest in my employees i don't have money we're in an economic downturn um things are so uncertain and so you know our focus today was just to talk about well there's so many different ways to do it and um, um, I agree with you, Shar, when you say like, not that I, I love what's happened, but I love how it's forced companies to really take a look at changing. I, I kind of uh, laughed to myself a little bit about how uh, before coronavirus, working from home one day a week or two days a week, it was like, that's all you could do. And it was a thing. And, um, and now it's like, why? it's not even will i even go back into office you know like will i even want to do that um and so the hope the hope is that the idea with lifelong learning and and having that opportunity to uh change your career within a company or just become an intermediate through different uh different skills uh is just something that people uh are aware of and they they're aware that it can happen in in many different ways and and now we're starting to talk about it um, I also thank you, Danita, for uh, pointing that out. If you do have a Vancouver Public Library card, you can access Linda courses. So again, just another great example. You know, there's Linda, Udemy. Uh, at Lighthouse Labs, we we have a couple Thinkific courses for like free coding um, and, and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, I it, it, does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to uh, post them in the chat. Um, we're kind of uh, wrapping things up there. Uh, for today, but uh, we will be posting some some stuff about upskilling um, on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, I encourage you add a connection to, to Lloyd or to Shar, to myself. And I mean, these two people are incredibly embedded in, in the BC tech world and, and they know what it's like either to uh, be on the HR side of things and as an employee. Um, Char, I know, is the one person that every day at work, different audio book or a different article <laughs> had something to talk about, which was uh, which was great. God bless audio books also. Yes. <laughs> God you can bless. multitask while you listen to an audio book. <laughs> um, so we do have a question. Um, I'm curious to hear about how company startups are investing in employee well-being employee well -being, and what your experience has been with this related to COVID and how important it might be moving forward. Um, yeah, Shar, do you want to take that one? 
Yeah, uh, I mean, hot topic. Uh, definitely, I'm in the HR tech group. We have a Slack channel. We're all pretty open with each other what we what what we're doing. Um, I think the the short answer is everyone's really aware aware of it. I think it's a really hard thing to accomplish, and I think it's just you know, you know, again, kind of a combination of really formal programs, if that's what works for your company. I know we are a small company, we have 25 people. And me as the HR person, I am leaning in all the time that I only have 25 um, staff members. So I'm actually like doing more of like the personal check ins. And we because we're small can kind of tailor people's needs. Um, I know that there are a lot of, of the benefit providers and the medical benefit providers are providing that kind of stuff. Now we have, um, there's different portals out there that give access to resources and um, you know those kind of that kind of help because that's really really challenging well-being kind of moves quickly into mental health which is a, a lot to put on your HR people um, but it doesn't mean that you know you can't look at things like your sick day policies we actually adjusted our sick day policies and went from a really strict sick day policy to one that like hey here's kind of your, your allotment up front um, no questions asked. After that, it's kind of like a conversation with your manager. And those conversations are like those those check ins like, hey, how's it going? Like, are you doing what you need to support yourself so that you can? How can we do this? And then just being flexible as an employer. So we've done things like adjusted schedules for parents who are working from home with kids during the pandemic. Um, you know, those personal check ins, obviously, you know, making mental health days you know, the same as sick days that people can unapologetically say, like, I just need a, I need a day to myself and I'm not aligned or I need a half day or I didn't get enough sleep last night. Um, I'll be on later. So just kind of encouraging those those things a little bit more is is what we're doing. And I know a lot of other people are doing. And then there are more formal programs. It's really it's really hard. Um, that That's a that's a big area. And there's some experts who know how to do that. But again, experts often you need to be able to pay for them. So I know large companies are putting more formal programs. So employers, if you're a smaller company, I'm happy to chat with you about kind of some of the ways to handle those um, those situations. But we do need to be taking care of people. You know, we need to be kind and we need to be mindful that people have a lot going on right right now these days for sure. Yeah, that's important. Like, like as an employee standpoint, I just appreciate like the manager actually checking in and yeah. like, hey, is it okay? Like. It, 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 can we be flexible? Is there anything that you need? I'm in a luckier situation where we're, we're doing fine, but I know that other people aren't nearly as lucky. And just that, that check-in actually makes a really big difference. And that's free. Yeah, that's free. Yeah. Checking in with your, putting a cadence. You can even automate it, to be honest. Like, yeah. There's so many things you can do to like make that check-in process easier and, and make sure it's happening and, and people are feeling supported and good. And hurt. Yeah, there's you can there's probably like a million Slack integrations that can just automatically, <laughs> uh, which is great. Yeah, and and that flexibility. I mean, I've been very lucky. I, I do a lot of writing uh, now with my job, a lot of grant writing, and and I write best at, in the evening. So I can say, hey, today I'm gonna uh, hang out in the daytime and uh kind of like relax a little bit, and I'll do my writing at night. That's my best time to write, and that's like a great kind of perk of a, of a, of a, the COVID fallout, I guess, um, is, is having that flexibility. So, um, that's an example for me of how my employer, you know, invested in my well-being is allowing me to kind of have a different hour, maybe for it, for a day if I need it. Um, absolutely. Awesome. I uh, hope, hopefully that answered your question, Natai. And, um, if we have any other questions just in the next, a um, minute or so, feel free to type them. Um, while you're thinking about that, um, just to let everyone know, of course, I do come from Lighthouse Labs. There are a lot of uh, upskilling options. We do have free courses. Uh, we also have something called the Career Accelerator, uh, which is uh, you can sign up and, and basically gives you access to a bunch of resources about um, helping you restart your career again. Um, and you can get a lot of micro learning. Um, I will post a link to Lighthouse Labs. You can also find us in the booth. Um, so it's just lighthouselabs.ca. Um, Perfect. And I'll just give a quick plug to my company. I, yeah. I always forget to do this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, for devs out there, um, please check out our community. It's just CTO.ai. We have the friendliest Slack community. And really, we, we kind of are doing micro learning too, because rather than having to become a huge DevOps expert, 
uh, you can actually use our tool and learn bits and pieces of the DevOps process and learn how to automate and write write ops and, and play around. Um, and we actually are looking to develop some more content too. So it's free to join our community. It's free to use our tool right now. Um, we're pretty pretty early stage along. So check it out. And uh, we are hiring. We're at the career fair tomorrow. And basically, uh, hint, hint, hint. Um, I do I do check and the first question I ask on the interview process is what do you think of our tools so um, we want we want people who believe what we're doing we want people who think what we're doing is really really cool and they they, they get the problem we're trying to solve so check us out too and, and get a little micro learning about DevOps while you're there and we have a YouTube channel we we, we interview lots of people the op show um, it interviews lots of really high caliber people about different topics and the intersections of dev and development and business um, so micro learning there's the there's the plug so my my boss will be happy with me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and DevOps has been such an incredibly like uh, trending topic in the past four or five years. So that's it's been yeah. amazing to watch what CTO is doing and um, YouTube channel, podcasts. You guys do it all. I love it. Um, and Lloyd, if you want to say anything about A Books, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I know A Books is always hiring, so it's uh, definitely a wonderful company. We're in Victoria, uh, it's so it's uh, yeah. Wonderful place to live and an amazing workplace as well. Fantastic. Um, all right. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for uh, the kind words about uh, enjoying the session. Um, I will be in the booth. Uh, we're going to post some stuff around upskilling on LinkedIn, and I'll make sure to, to tag uh, Lloyd and Char, and, and, and you can connect to them again. I would highly recommend you take these two up uh, on their offers to, to help you have that conversation around it because it's been top of mind, I, at least I know for sure, for the past five years. Um, <laughs> plus, you know, so um, definitely love to chat with everyone about them. And uh, just want to say uh, we hope that everyone is hanging in there. Um, we know that this is a very financially tough time for the startup community and um, we uh, just want to support you and I think uh, if everyone you know just comes together especially Vancouver it's been fantastic to watch uh, Vancouver Startup Week one of the most fun weeks of the year I was reminiscing about it last year um, uh, to just come together and support each other that's really the best thing that we can do um, moving forward so um, thank you so much Lloyd and Char I am forever grateful as always uh, to have you uh, join us today to talk about this topic and, and share your knowledge. I hope everyone got a little bit of micro learning today. <laughs>